Erev Tov Harim, I'm Stephen Benoon and you are watching Israeli News Live. Very provocative broadcast this evening. Uh, is the Pope of Rome and leading rabbis courting the Mahdi? Uh, the Vatican's quest for a Muslim Antichrist is seeming to backfire on them at this point now. This is a very provocative uh, message that we're going into tonight. It is really something as I have did the research, did the background on this broadcast. It has taken twists and turns one way and the other. It has been shocking to myself as well. And, uh, and what we're going to talk about this evening, no doubt, is going to shock you as well. I do know there is a lot of people that are wondering who is the Antichrist. We have always held to that it is the Pope of Rome. And even after this, this evening, I still hold to my claim and my passionate faith, and I try to be very objective of this, that as far as a Mahdi, this is something the Vatican has tried to fabricate from the early days, wanting to distract the people from knowing who they really are. You have to remember, the church fathers, all the way down through time, have always taught that the Vatican has been your number one enemy. That is where the Antichrist seat resides at. It's only been in modern times with modern teachers that have actually changed the tide and brought in the, the theory or the ideology uh, as that there would be a Muslim Antichrist. And they have really pushed this hard, especially using the Quran as the backing for the idea of the Mahdi. Well, tonight's broadcast is going to shed some interesting light on that, something I did not know myself. But anyway, let's get right into this and uh, without any further de delay. Those of you that might remember this photograph here is Pope Francis there with uh, Rabbi uh, Yeshayahu Hollander. Yes, he is there giving him a book. We spoke about this because why Rabbi Hollander was uh, a defending uh, the defendant for Pope Francis during the famous uh, trial last year during September where the Sanhedrin Council had accused Pope Francis and Barack Obama of incitement of violence against the Jewish people. And it was right here, the very rabbi you see in this picture here back in 2013, the picture was taken of Rabbi Hollander there giving a gift to Pope Francis from his very dear friend, uh, philosopher, as he's considered to be, uh, Adnan Akhtar. Uh, so we did a story about this, not so much about Adnan, but we were doing it about the, uh, the Pope of Rome and their Rabbi uh, Yeshayahu Hollander. But I got an interesting email from a very precious sister, a dear friend of mine, uh, that really caused me to do some very deep searching and deep thinking about the whole subject when she said to me the other day, that certain Sanhedrin rabbis are actually willing to accept the Mahdi as the Mashiach if he will bring world peace. Well, once I got that, I went to researching and I went to digging. And I have dug yesterday and pretty much the entire day today looking to find out where did this come from, where is it leading, and what's going on. It took me back through the history of Israel here the last few years, some of the major leading stories that we have been watching about the coming of the Third Temple, etc. cetera, uh, and it has totally blown my mind away to find out how duped we have been in believing some of the reports without doing our own homework. Very prominent news sources, uh, and this is what we're going to find out this evening. I want to take you right here. By the way, that photo there, it appeared on channel A9 out of Turkey. That's Adnan Akhtar's television channel who posted this photo here. Let me read what the article states here. And this is on uh, Mr. Adnan Akhtar's books received by Pope Francis. Diplomacy post on January 11th of 2014 did the article. It says, Adnan Akhtar sent the books to Pope Francis. They were delivered by Rabbi Hollander directly to, po to the Pope. And the Pope said he had, did, had been deeply impressed by the books. Rabbi Yeshayahu Hollander, head of the Sanhedrin court for B'nai Noah, met with the Pope on December the 11th of 2013. He presented the Pope with Adnan Akhtar's gifts during that audience. There were several gifts that he gave him there. Uh, the Pope, as you can see by the photograph there, was very pleased to get them. Uh, later expresses that he had, uh, was deeply impressed by the books there. 
Uh, so I, I, I have not tried to corro corroborate that information secondhandly with the Pope there, but that's what the article says here on Diplomacy Post. Uh, but when you see tonight what I find, what I've discovered, uh, I think you'll do some more digging as well. Another article here, the Temple Mount activist Rabbi Yehuda Glick talks peace in Turkey. Uh, everybody remembers this story. story. Even uh, Brother Begley, who knows uh, Rabbi Glick, he's, he's met him personally. He doesn't know him, I guess you couldn't say really uh, deeply, but he has had the opportunity of meeting Rabbi Glick. I was there in Israel during the time that he met him. Uh, but anyway, this article here was on July 5th of 2015, the Jewish press. Uh, and, uh, and of course, those, for those of you that do not know about Rabbi Glick, he uh, sur survived the assassination attempt where a Muslim, uh, after his speeches one night, shot him, pulled up on a motorcycle, shot him at point blank range four times in the chest, nearly ki killed the man. And, uh, and that's how Brother Paul and, and uh, Pastor Paul Begley and, and this man became friends because Pastor Paul put out a, a cry for the people to pray for him uh, because of him being shot. But this here is very dis, uh, discouraging. What I'm a, uh, Well, let me read to you this article here before we go further. Uh, uh, this meeting uh, where Rabbi Glick went to uh, Turkey to meet with Adnan Akhtar, being the main person he was going to meet with there, as well as some other clerics there, uh, was during the month of Ramadan the month-long celebration of Ramadan, uh, which is, that's just a serious issue. Anyway, Temple Mount Activists Heritage Foundation head Rabbi Yehuda Glick traveled to Turkey last week to talk about peace. Glick, who traveled to Istanbul with Likud Party Druze member Mindy uh, Safa, 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 excuse me, Safadi, met for discussion with Islamic officials and those of several other faiths. Local sources told JewishPress.com, that's the article where this is from, okay? The, the com conversation between Glick and the Mufti were, was very friendly and described the atmosphere as cordial. Glick's views on peace, particularly importance during Ramadan in an Islamic nation whose bond with Israel has faltered in recent years were well received, the source said. Uh, even Rabbi Glick mentioned about how that uh, it was... You know, people ask him, was you scared going there? He said, no. He said, I wasn't scared at all. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Anyway, let me give you a little bit of background, though, about Ramadan, because some people may not know the, uh, where Ramadan actually comes from. We just take it as an Islamic tradition. But according to Dr. Rafat Am Amari uh, of the uh, ReligionResearchInstitute.org, he writes this, Ramadan was originally an annual ritual performed at the city of Haran. Similarities, similarities between the Ramadan and Haran and the Islamic Ramadan. Although the fasting of Ramadan was practiced in pre-Islamic times by, a, by pagans and Jiliya, uh, uh, it was introduced to Arabia by the Haranians. Haran was a city of the border between Syria and Iraq, very close to Asia Minor, which today is Turkey. Their main deity was the moon, and the worship of the moon, they conducted a major fast which lasted 30 days. It began the 8th of March and usually finished the 8th of April. Arabic historians such as Ibn Hazam identify this fast with Ramadan. Okay, so kind of an odd thing to throw into the Islamic way of doing, but that kind of seems to be the trend in, in, in other faiths as well, taking on pagan traditions. But anyway, Adman Akbar here, the very man that uh, you saw in the picture with Rabbi Glick, who he met with as well. Uh, this is uh, from one of the many videos I have watched about this man here, trying to get an understanding of who he is especially in light that he gave these books, these gifts to Pope, the Pope of Rome and the Pope being impressed by them. Who is this man? Because he also is very passionate for the building of the third temple. In fact, he is the key source of why you see so many articles that Turkey coming out that they're saying that the Turkey, the Muslim people are for the building of the third temple. Anyway, it says here, let us build the temple. This is his own words. Let us build the temple of Solomon at once and the lovely palace of the prophet Solomon. Now that is Adnan Akbar's own words right there on his television, A9. Uh, and, and this was an article on WND, Muslim leader wants the temple rebuilt. 
Uh, all right, now watch what the article states here. This was on August the 6th of 2009. In a historically unprecedented development, a famous Turkish Muslim leader and prominent group of Israeli rabbis have joined together on one, on, excuse me, on one of their declared goals to rebuild the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Adnan Akhtar, who uses the pen name Haran Yahya, is a controversial but highly influential Muslim intellectual and author with over 65 million of his books in circulation worldwide. Akhtar, recently met with three representatives from the reestablished Jewish Sanhedrin, a group of 71 Orthodox rabbis and scholars from Israel to discuss how religious Muslims, Jews, Christians can work together. Now, I saw the article myself when it came out back in, uh, you know, what is that, six years ago now, almost seven years, going on well, about six and a half years. And like many people, it was very odd to see that the Muslims, there was a Muslim group that was interesting in building the temple. But you know, when I read the article, as so many people did, many people reported about these things, I am thinking the same, no doubt that, you know, why would the Muslim people want to be, want to be part of the building of the third temple? It just seemed odd. And you also assume that you're thinking of Muslim clerics. You're thinking of the, the religious that there is a religious group of Muslims that want to do it. Well, this man is religious. He is a, uh, I would consider him more of a cleric than just a, um, a, a as they put in here about him, a high, an intellectual. Some people call him a philosopher. Uh, but it's going to be interesting what you're going to find out about this man. Anyway, so I was listening to one of these videos and it said the Pope knows about the Mahdi and Jesus the Messiah. And as I begin to look at some of the things he speaks about, in fact, one place they asked him directly, are you the Mahdi? Uh, because of the way he goes on and on and on about the Mahdi. And he says, no, I'm not. He says, but then again, the Mahdi would never say who he is. And so they asked for examples, who would be like the Mahdi? He says, well, the Mahdi will be a man that unites the world together. He will unite the world's religions together. He will bring, the, bring Islam. He will bring the Muslims and the Jews all together. He will cause that uniting uh, factor in there. That's what the Mahdi will do. Now, this is what he kept going on and on and on about. And he even used Pope Francis as uh, uh, an example of someone as in his own words, the way he was saying it there, he has totally changed history completely. He talks about how the Pope of Rome, this was one of the big issues for him here, that when the Pope met uh, the, the Russian Orthodox uh, uh, Kirill, met him, Patriarch Kirill, he said that was the most historic event. 949 years had been since they had come together and sat down. And he talked about how that that was such an honorable thing that the Pope did. And he said, look at the way the Pope is reaching out to the, to the Muslim world. And he even said the Pope did something that no one, no other Pope in history has ever done. He said he has broken the cross. And when he said that, he tells his people, notice what I'm talking about. You know how they do the sign of the cross over their body there? He said the Pope does the sign, but he doesn't do the cross in, in, his, in his movement there. He said, showing that he had broken the cross. And what did this man here say, Adnan Akhtar? He said that that means the Pope really believes in one God. And as I began to listen to these things and watch what was going on, I realized something is up. They're up to something. One, he wants to build, he wants to see the, the Solomon's temple go up. He's meeting with prominent rabbis from around the world. Uh, he's especially meeting with Jewish rabbis from Israel, or Israeli rabbis, I should say. They're, all the rabbis are Jewish, that'd be obvious. But anyway, he's meeting with Israeli rabbis that are, are Jewish. That, well, we got the Messianics too. That's, I, forget, I forget about that. But anyway, but he's meeting with the Jewish rabbis there, like Rabbi Glick. He's Re Rabbi Hollander. He's Re uh, Rabbi Abrams Abramson. I mean, it is unbelievable the number of rabbis that this man has met with and world dignitaries, also Freemasons and you, you name it, he's met with them. And, and that's, you'll see that, that's actually here. But anyway, this is just to kind of give you a little bit of background. This man, he's really majors on the Mahdi coming. He majors on the, that Yeshua will come as well. 
He says Yeshua comes after the Mahdi comes. Uh, and the more you listen to it, though, it I, at least when I listen to him, I'm, you know, to me it sounds like he thinks he's, himself is the Mahdi. Well, in doing some research, I find out that's exactly what he does believe. Now, let me bring this article to your attention as well. Pope Francis and Iranian president warn end times are nigh. Your Newswire on January 30th of 2016, responding to President Rouhani's claim that the Mahdi is coming, because Rouhani was telling him that, the Mahdi is coming, Pope Francis confirmed that indeed he is, but that his name is Christ. See, what? The anointed, the Mashiach. Now see, the Pope doesn't believe it's two different people, but Adnan does believe it's two different people, all right? The Pope issued a call to action for Christians, Muslims, and Jews to unite and prepare for the arrival. All those of the Abrahamic faiths, now is the time for unity, for the end times are nigh. You know, this Pope is bold. Not only is he trying to unite these religions together, Christianity, Muslims, and he says what? He says, they all, we all have the same God. We serve the same God. That's what the Pope says. Well, you know what? The rabbis must seem to believe that as well because Rabbi Hollander and Rabbi Abramson were sitting there on the television program with Adnan Akhtar, and when they would get to this little uh, saying that they have, uh, uh, Isha Allah, uh, uh, or, or Ishna Allah and Masha Allah, one means... Uh, uh, may it be the will of God uh, in one, you know, if God wills. I think Isha Allah is if God wills, and yeah, Masha Allah would be uh, if, uh, uh, you know, uh, God has willed it. Now, the problem is, is Allah is not God's name, okay? It's not God. God has a divine name, all right? And it's not Allah. But to see that these rabbis, for the, for the sake of the, the, the Muslim religion for the sake of unity that the Pope is pushing, they're willing to bow down and, and say whatever makes the Muslim happy. And the Pope, Pope of Rome is, is saying the same thing. He says, Allah is the same as our God. I'm like, oh my God. This, this, friends, this is nuts here. Let me do, watch what happens here. Now this here is another clip from the television program where they had done the subtitles in English. They don't do it on all of them, by the way, so if you're looking, it's hard to find the ones in English. Uh, in fact, I did a lot of translating of his uh, web pages from the Turkish language to English. So I learned a lot about this man over the last couple of days. But anyway, it says the Pope will be there. Now he's talking about uh, an event. Adnan Akhtar is talking about an event here when he says the Pope will be there. They, they elected him specifically for that task. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about that the Mahdi is going to present himself at the Temple Mount and the Pope of Rome, he says, the chief rabbi of Israel and the head Iman will walk arm in arm down, and they, he calls it that they will walk through Lot's Gate. Now, I, I'm not sure if you guys know where this thing is, Lot's Gate. I don't know about Lot's Gate. There, none of the gates in, in historical part of Israel that I'm aware of was ever called Lot's Gate. Maybe there is. Maybe there's something the Muslims believe that I don't understand about. But anyway, he said that gate will be open for the first time in 4,000 years. He said, and they will walk through there. He says, and when they do, he says, the religions will finally be united and they will lay the first cornerstone for the third temple. Now that's his way of thinking. That's why he says the Pope will be there. They elected him especially for that task. Well, you know, the Pope's got a different idea, though. At first, I was beginning to wonder if there's not some kind of secret plan going on. I'm sure there is a secret plan going on because I know the Vatican has been working with the Temple Institute. And we already know the Temple Institute is now bringing in the Kohanim. I'd gotten a very interesting letter. Could never corroborate it, so I haven't said much about it as of yet. But they say, according to the letter that I received, that there is a secret plan for a mass that will be done on the Temple Mount with the Pope present there, and as well with certain uh, rabbis from the Temple Institute there uh, to do a specific mass there. Now, I don't know. I cannot confirm that. I've never been able to corroborate that information, so I don't say much about it. So there again, that's only speculation at this point. All right, so let's move on here. Now, this happened. This is what's interesting. 
This guy here, the Adnan Akhtar, is constantly talking about how the Pope is going to come there. They're going to all meet up together and they're going to walk arm in arm. I know the Pope, though, is trying to do the same thing that Adnan Akhtar is doing, and that is to bring a unity. And undoubtedly, the Pope is using Adnan Akhtar to be a part of this because the Pope receives his book from Rabbi Hollander and as well commends his book by saying it was very moving. So there's something going on here, but the question is, does people know just how odd this man really is? You're going to find out in a moment. Anyway, but watch this. Rabbi Rabinovich, uh, to the Pope, the people of Israel live on in the land of Israel. This was on the Jewish press, May 26, 2014. As you can see the uh, picture there, Rabbi uh, Rabinovich is right there. Uh, uh, excuse me, Rabinovich is right there uh, to the left of your screen there. He says, uh, the Jerusalem you have arrived at, honored Pope, oh my God, honored Pope, is not only the physical Jerusalem, it is also the Jerusalem of dreams, he states, the dreams of millions of Jews throughout 2,000 long years of exile. Jerusalem is a dream that has been realized. We are still walking in, its, in it as dreamers, expecting the full realization of the dream, said Rabbi Rab Rab uh, Rabinov Rabinovich. I get his name mixed up, uh, Rabbi, that I used to go to his synagogue in, Amer in America. It was uh, Rabinovich, so it was a very, very sim similar name there. Uh, relating to the destruction of the Second Temple, Rabbi Rabinovich spoke to Titus, uh, spoke, excuse me, of Titus's Ark in Rome, which depicts the exile of the Jews. It is true, uh, Titus succeeded in taking the menorah, candelabrum, and the tools of the temple. But the light of faith and the hope to return to the land of our fathers, he has not successfully extinguishing, he remarked. Now, the article went on to speak about how the rabbi, you know, it appears that he's alluding to the fact that the Romans did this and hoping the Pope might say something, you know, to kind of give them a little bit of hope that they can go back on the Temple Mount. You know, but the Pope watched very carefully. He watched what's going on. He looked at the temple sitting on the temple mount there. And then afterwards, he walks over to the wall and he puts in his little prayer into the wall. See, same article right here, Jewish Press, May 26, 2014. And then he goes back, he says, after hearing Rabbi Rabinovich speech, the Pope placed a note in the wall and then signed a visitor of books where he expressed his thanks and quoted the prophet Isaiah. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. My friends, do you realize how provocative his words are? Do you realize, not just provocative, to me, it, it is a statement. This Pope here listens in silence as he listens to the Jewish rabbi's plea because he wants to see his temple go back up. But you know, one thing is, God did not, he, you know, he, he built a body. This is the temple. Yeshua was that temple that was destroyed and reared, raised back up again. But then when the Pope quoted this right here, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. My friends, I have been telling you for the last more than a year now, almost two years now, they're going to fake a millennial reign. That is a millennial reign quotation. He is telling the Jews, you quit lifting up your sword against nation. That's what will bring peace. But he is claiming to be that peacemaker. He's the one crying out for the peace in all of Israel and all of the rest of the world. Now, if that doesn't add injury to insult, look at the date. May 26, 2014, he's down there at the Wailing Wall. Anybody that knows the story, anybody that knows the history, you know what happens next. He goes up there on up to David's tomb from there and holds the mass. Let me read another part here, though. This is where Adnan Akhtar, he states this here, the rabbi I spoke to who visited from Israel... That's Rabbi Hollander and Rabbi uh, Abramson. I, I, I believe that was the right on the ones he's speaking about. I can't say this for sure. He said, about this, said the Pope will be there. The Pope's going to be where? 
Now, he's talking about the building of the third temple. Now, this is why you know something is up. You know, regardless of the way this guy really is, when you're, you're going to see a little bit about what he's, what he's, <laughs> it's a shame that rabbis are associating with this man. But the thing is, is you're going to find out that he, he does have some inside information nonetheless. Because he said, the rabbi I spoke to have visited from Israel about this, said the Pope will be there. That, what is he talking about? He's talking about the coming of the Messiah. Because why? Remember, the sister that emailed me from Israel that said, Brother, we have certain rabbis here right now in the Sanhedrin, Rabbi Hollander being one of them, that are saying that they believe they would accept the Mahdi if he would bring peace. See, now the Jews don't believe in two different Mashiachs either. They said they would accept the Mahdi as Mashiach if he would bring peace to Israel. Oh my God, friends. You realize how serious that is. So then he says here, the rabbi I spoke to about this said the Pope will be there. So the Jews actually know that there's an event coming when the Messiah, in this case, not the Mahdi, but the Messiah will be coming and that the Pope is going to be there? Friends, they're up to something. Why do you think the Temple Institute has been preparing what they're preparing for? Do you think God really wants the blood sacrifices again? Do you th that would be a slap in the face of Yeshua to do that again. I don't say that they won't try to do it, though. I'm not going to say that they're not going to try to do it, but he's going to stop it. He's not going to allow it. As I said, though, May 26, 2014, just like you just saw in the Jewish press in the article there where the Pope was at the Wailing Wall, same day, Pope says to them, nation won't rise against nation and they won't lift up sword anymore. Then he goes over there to King David's uh, right there at his throne there. It goes up there because why? Remember, Israel had given the Pope a Roman official seat the year before at King David's tomb. An official seat, King David's tomb, that's a chair for the king. He goes over there, puts on that triple crown on his head, sits there in the upper room declaring himself to be the Mashiach. The humility in your nature and the power in your spirit raised a spiritual election and a thirst for peace, Perez told him at a ceremony in the garden of the presidential residence, he said later that evening, to the Pope of Rome. He comes there, speaks about a millennial reign to the rabbis, and then goes over there and sits in the upper room as if he were sitting in the seat of Yeshua himself, surrounded by his disciples. Holds the communion service there. And the next morning, the rabbis go, or not the rabbis, but the priests go in there again and hold another service in the tomb of King David this time. My gosh. Now, this is another article that came out in 2013. I want to read this one to you as well. A new Muslim vision, rebuilding Solomon's temple together. A new Muslim vision, rebuilding Solomon's temple together. The Jewish Press, March 14, 2013, by Sanim uh, Tiapar. She wrote in this article here, As a devout, devout Muslim, I take pleasure when Jews pray to, God, to Almighty God. And their praying anywhere in the world, including at the Temple Mount, would be a glad tiding for me as well. Now that sounds shocking. That, sound, that actually sounds wonderful. A Muslim would wants to see the Jews praying at the Temple Mount? No wonder why Rabbi Yehuda Glick went there. Now, in that same article at the bottom, it says about the author, Sanim Tiyapar is an executive producer on a Turkish television. She is a political and religious commentator and a peace activist. She can be reached on Facebook and Twitter. I wanted to see, because I'm trying to understand, why is this? I know Adnan Akhtar is major proponent out of Turkey for building the third temple. So I began to look at the stories behind this. Who's writing these stories? Where did they come from? So this one here, I clicked on that nice little Facebook link there just to see who it was. Sanin Tiapar. 
author of the jewishpress.com article that I just shared with you, happens to be one of what Mr. Adnan Akhtar refers to as his kittens. She posts his face on there. And this man here believes he is the Mahdi. Now the Pope of Rome, he needs a, detract, a distraction so that no one looks at the Vatican or any of the popes of Rome, whether it be him or a future pope to come, because some people say he'll retire. I've, I've said for a long time, doesn't matter. He retires, another one takes his place. You see, the Antichrist, even when John spoke about it, he said they, and there are many Antichrists, and they went out from us, from among us, because they were not of us. That's what John writes about. If they went out from them, they must have been believing Yeshua to be the Messiah, huh? Well, of course, he claims he believes Yeshua to be the Messiah too, but at that time there, in the days of John, they were all what we would call today Christians. All right? The Antichrist is not coming from the Muslim religion. And by the way, you have to remember, it was the Vatican that conspired and made the Islamic religion the Prophet Muhammad, every bit of it is a fabrication of the Roman Catholic Church to kill off the true believing Christians that, were, that, that went against the Roman uh, Constantine theology behind the Vatican's uh, newly found uh, uh, state church religion. And they went and killed off their, uh, the, the, the Jewish people, as many as they could. It was like a Hitler back then. Church and state united together to wipe out anything that didn't agree with them. So anyway, you're going you're gonna to find out about this guy a little bit more. It's very interesting to see. This guy right here, Edep Yuxel, and, I, and if I don't say his name right, uh, I apologize. Uh, I run across an article that he had written. He is a very famous author, himself. Uh, like they would say about Adnan Akhtar, but I ran across an article that he wrote about Adnan Akhtar. Just so happens, he was a very good friend of Adnan Akhtar when they were young. And I'm not going to throw stones, but if you go and watch the videos and you watch what's going on in Turkey with this man, you'll see it matches exactly what this man writes and on, many, on many issues anyway. I can't uh, say about everything. Anyway, according to the, I got this from Wikipedia about this man here, Edep uh, Yuxel, Free Encyclopedia. I don't like using Wikipedia for a source for anything, but I did it for a reason in this case. You'll figure this out a little bit later, maybe. Yuxel was born in Turkey in 1957 into Kurdish family. His father, a Sanhedrin, uh, excuse me, Sadradin Yuxel is an Islamic scholar taught Arabic at the Turkish University. His brother, Mitten Yuxel, an Islamist activist was assassinated by far-right nationalists. Yuxel says that he was an outspoken Islamist as a youth and spent years in prison for his views. Uh, Yuxel says that he broke with Islam in 1986 and adopted the Quran alone philosophy as preached by Yashad uh, Khalifa. I guess in, in Judaism, that would be the same pretty much as what we call the... Um, uh, Gosh, my brain is going blank on things right now. Sorry, anyway. Uh, but anyway, author of, he's author of many books on the Quran and Islam. Uh, from what I understand, he had sold millions of books in Turkey back when he was an author there. He says he now teaches philosophy and logic at Pima Community College and medical ethics and criminal law courses at Brown Mackey College. All right, that's just to give you a little bit of background about who the man is. Uh, but anyway, this is something that he wrote in an article as is as, as entitled, Who is Haran uh, Yahya? And by the way, we already saw this a little bit earlier. That is Anan Akhtar. That is a pen name that he uses on the books that, uh, that he is supposedly the authors of. An Islamic creationist cult or an Islamic recreational sex cult is what he titles the art article. As the author Edep Yuxel reveals his views about Anan Akhtar. This is what he writes. And by the way, the man that's standing there with Adnan Akhtar is a Freemason. You can see the little sign on his chest there. And he does say in another interview where I was watching him that, uh, that not only the Pope of Rome will be there when the Mahdi comes to the Temple Mount, 
but he says uh, the, it would be the Pope of Rome, it'll be the head Iman, it'll be the head rabbis of Israel, and it will also, he said, will be the Freemasons and the Knights of Templar will be there. I'm like, this is really wild. Anyway, uh, according to uh, Yuxel, he says he was extremely obsessed with uh, recruiting the handsome children of the rich people wearing expensive clothes. He was not interested in guiding poor people. Adnan had danced among many contradictory positions, but the single conviction he has maintained since early 1980s is Adnan Akhtar is the promised Mahadi. All right who is, again, the same article here by Yuxel, he goes on to say, I tried to tell him that the hadiths about Mahdi were among the most fabricated and unreliable hadiths, even according to the lousy standards of hadith experts. They were fabricated by the supporters of Unmayed and, uh, uh, and Abbasid dynasties to promote the interests of the sultans. His take on Masons and Zionists is just a strategy to get him into international fame, in popularity to final, finally announce his mission to the world. His cult resembles the modest operandi and moon of Scientology cult targeting afflu affluent people and exploiting their resources. Now that's what he writes here. Now, the one thing I want you to notice though that he said, and I did not know this, I already knew as far as the Quran itself, this was nothing but a fabrication of the Catholic Church. That was uh, brought out by the former Jesuits there uh, from the Catholic Church, been more than one, uh, but, but definitely has been exposed by the former Jesuits of the Catholic Church there that it indeed was done. Uh, it was uh, uh, Cardinal B that did the lecture on this, uh, and it was actually um, the former Jesuit priest there, um, Alberta Rivera, that's who it was. I knew I had to think just for a second there. Alberto Rivera uh, was the rabbi, or excuse me, the, the former Jesuit for the Catholic Church uh, that came out and exposed uh, what he had learned from Cardinal B there at the Vatican about the creation of the Muhammad, uh, the, or the Muslim faith there. And Muhammad, how that uh, Muhammad had married Kaji, uh, who was a uh, uh, well known to be a Catholic girl that was part of the Catholic uh, faith there. And she was brought in, a very wealthy girl, to bring Muhammad in. And they, they, they ended up making sure that they got married. And then uh, all kinds of things that happened in order to be able to write the Quran. They said that uh, uh, Muhammad did not know how to write. That it was actually written by Catholic monks in Northern Africa. Very interesting story you can look at and go into. But anyway, uh, but let's, say, let's take the objective side here for just a moment. Let's say that the Quran was written by Muhammad. Okay, just from an objective standpoint here. Uh, and when you read right here, though, that according to Yuxel, that the Hadiths, uh, the, by the way, the Hadith is one of the chapters in uh, the, the Quran that speaks about the coming of the Mahdi. When he says here that the Hadiths were fabricated and that they're unreliable, that got my attention. I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute. you got to be kidding me because there's so many... Uh, Christian theologians, ministers, and everything that are quoting about the coming Mahdi, that it's going to be the Antichrist. We know, for one, I don't use the Quran as uh, my plumb line for, for determining biblical prophecy. You know, clearly, we have the prophets of Israel that have prophesied. We have the apostles that have prophesied. John has prophesied of the things that are going to happen in this world. John spoke about the coming of the Antichrist. We see the prophets prophesying of, of, of the things that would happen in modern days and that are coming to pass. The last thing I want to do is start quoting as prophecy from a Quran that I know that the Vatican clerics themselves have forged in the first place. And then to find a faithful, uh, Yuxel is a very faithful Muslim. Uh, he is a uh, Kurdish Muslim on top of it. And, and I have really myself have defended the Kurds as, from what Turkey is doing. They're just murdering the Turkish or the Kurdish people over there. And, uh, but then to find out that this man here, who's a very faithful to his religion, says that it's fabricated. The, the Hadiths are fabricated. Well, I thought, okay, that's interesting, but I, it, it did catch my attention, so I'm like, I've got to look more into this. Is there truth to that? Well, when I begin to look and do research, there were all kinds of documentation about them being 
uh, a, a fabrication. And then on top of it, though, it is the Muslim people that are writing about it being a fabrication. But then the, one of the things that really caught my attention was the New Encyclopedia of Islam. And it's by uh, Surreal Glass and Houston Smith. And this is quoted directly from the, uh, the New Encyclopedia of Islam. It says, Ibn uh, Khaldun remarked on the well-known bad memory of the family of the principal transmitters of uh, Mahdi Hadith as a way of saying that the Mahdi Hadith are false. I actually typed that wrong. I apologize. False. is The word is false there. They do not appear in the Sahayan and first with Abu Dawood. But on the other hand, since there were also Hadith which denied the existence of Mahdi, it was ultimately theological consensus which determined which hadith would lead to the elaboration of the doctrine and which would not. So they're saying that they're a fabrication, but then they're also saying there's one set of them that says that there was not, there's not going to be a Mahdi, then there's another set that there is a Mahdi, and then they say that this was, it was never in the, uh, uh, the actual uh, Sahayan, uh, uh, being an older version of the Quran. So this is fascinating to me to find this out that all the, all the prophecies of the Hadith or the Mahdi Hadith are totally a fabrication. Shouldn't have even been there in the begin with, to begin with. Uh, so it just leads to one issue after another. Anyway, uh, Adnan Akhtar, this is a little bit about him that was on Wikipedia as well. Uh, and I only use this as a secondary source in uh, light of what uh, Yukel, excuse me, uh, uh, Yuxel is writing in his article about who is Haran uh, uh, Yan, uh, Yan, excuse me, Yanya, which is Adnan Akhtar's uh, uh, pen name. It says Adnan Akhtar, born uh, February 2nd, 1956, also known as Haran uh, Yaya, is a Turkish author as well as Islamic creationist. In 2007, he sent thousands of his unsolicited copies of his book. The Atlas of Creation, which advocates Islam as creationism to American scientists, members of Congress, and science and museums. In more recent years, Adnan Akhtar has been known for his television evangelism on his TV channel, A9 TV, noted especially for featuring kittens, uh, his female devotees. His organization is commonly referred to as a cult, and he, and he has been described as the most notorious cult leader in Turkey. Uh, Akhtar filed more than 5,000 lawsuits against individuals for defamation in the last decade and led to blocking of a number of prominent websites in Turkey. All right, so this is what they're saying about him. Now, when it speaks about the kittens, now you might know why they say that. Uh, and I hate that I even had to bring this photo up on here. Uh, I feel for the women as well because they're being exploited. If you watch his television program, the, the most provocative, women that you'll ever see on, on television. Uh, every one of these poor women have been to, been to a plastic manufacturing shop and have been totally redone. Uh, and then he puts them up there, especially on the television, they're just half dressed, everything else you can imagine and everything sexual can be there for anyone to see. Okay, uh, this here, again, going back to Yuxel, he says, it would be in the best interest of the naive and young pupils to join his cause since soon he will be ruling the entire world and they would be his lucky and powerful aides. He says this kind of facetiously. He says, besides the cult provides a holy club for the children of the rich and well connected. So Yuxel was saying that you had to be, even he said from the earliest days, part of the article I don't put in here, he says that when he, he actually met him in prison, he talks about that the reason he met him there was because he had been arrested, Yuxel had been arrested, uh, for the books that he writes, and they considered it inciting uh, uh, protest in Turkey, so they arrested him. But he was recognized by a doctor at the prison uh, as being that famous author, and to protect him, he pulled him out of the main part of the prison where the murderers, convicted murderers, etc., uh, robbers and stuff were at, and, they, and he moved him to the infirmary section of the prison. He said this is where he met Adnan Akhtar, and he said Adnan Akhtar was there dodging the draft, for the military, the mandatory draft of the military and the Turkish military there, claiming that he was mentally ill. He said he did win, and he, you know, even though he was in the hospital there, the prison hospital there for trying to dodge a draft, 
that he did get the doctors to declare him mentally ill. And he said he's used that to get out of a lot of court cases over the years. But anyway, he said after they got out, they did become friends. He said, but he always noticed that Adnan never wanted to really to be associated with him because in Yuxel's case, he was more strict about his beliefs. And he noticed that Adnan always was interested in only associating with very wealthy, elite college students that he could get them to believe him. That was his opinion on that anyway. So anyway, he says, besides the cult provides a holy club for the children of the rich and well-connected, they also get secondhand girls as a fringe benefit. In turn, they lose their freedom and part of their identity, he states. Now, in light of this, not only the information that you see that's written there, not only the information that, that's public, even WND said he is a highly controversial individual. And anybody can look up and see what type of television program he's running. He appears to be drunk on half of them. I've seen him when he's not. He's very quick, very sharp in his mind. And then there's other ones. You, you can't wonder if he's intoxicated of, with something, whether it be drugs, whether it be alcohol. There's wine sitting on the table beside him, or at least appears to be wine. And, and then on top of that, all these women that are just masquerading all over the television set. And then rabbis that have some of the strictest rules, they won't even shake a woman's hand, and they're going to meet this man. Do they, do, what do they do? Go hide all the women? You know, the thing to begin with, it is, it is bringing them to a place that is dangerous with the association that they have with this man. Not to, not to mention that he's claiming to be the Mahdi. All right, now watch what he continues to say. Uh, it's getting, we're closing on this last frame here. Adnan uses proxies and gets credit for everything, Yuxil says. He uses his medical report and gets away for any criminal charge. There are a lot to learn from Adnan Akhtar or the exploiter of the names of the two messengers of God, Haran and Yahya. His followers, mostly educated and rich, yet gullible youngsters, work day and night to prepare books and videos mostly plagiarized from works of Western scientists and artists. In the end, those collaborative and uh, plagiarized works are altogether credited to Haran Yahya. Thus, Haran Yahya is a brand name and an artificial name aimed to boost of the books and credited to him were written by his former follower, Meetan uh, Kamiladar. I don't know if I'm saying his name right or not, who also used the nickname Kavit Yalsen. Where are you, Kavit Yalsen, now? He asked the question. Are you now renting your nickname as his former student, uh, excuse me, nickname as a portal for Haran Yahya's websites, or is it taken away from you? He asked. His former student, M.A., who has a long time declared his freedom from the uh, Adnan Akhtar, wrote most of the books on evolution. Unfortunately, M.A.'s books are published under the pen name of Haran Yahya and credited to Adan Akhtar. Like many of Adan's former students who know well the dirty tricks of their former master, M.A. too is trying to forget the days when he was a young and naive university student. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live. We trust this message has been a blessing for you. And right after this here, if you need our new address, it'll appear on the screen, our post office box. Uh, we did have to go to a post office box, friends, because of security issues for the family. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.